seemed to me of the man he used. The man of twists and turns, driven time and again off course, once he had plundered the hallowed heights of Troy. Many cities of men he saw and learned their minds. Many pains he suffered, heartsick on the open sea, fighting to save his life and bring his comrades home. But he could not save them from disaster, hard as he strove. The recklessness of their own ways destroyed them all. The blind fools, they devoured the cattle of the sun, and the sun god wiped from sight the day of their return. That is the opening paragraph of book one of the Odyssey. I'm really excited to get into this book uh, with all of you. This is so good, and uh, this is just the beginning. Uh, so, as we talked about when we were reading the Iliad, opening lines of ancient text is incredibly important. Uh, so it's worth noting uh, those opening lines. Uh, read them over a few times, and then we'll revisit them uh, we'll, once we get to the end of the book, because the end also will uh, be extremely important. Uh, so quick, just some setup for this uh, epic poem. It has now been ten years since Troy has fallen. It took ten years to fight Troy, and now the Greeks have, for the most part, all returned, except for Odysseus. We find him uh, starting out on the island of Calypso, uh, who's the daughter of Atlas, and he's been there for, for a while, and he's weeping. He wants to go home. That's all he wants. And this is year 10 of him being at sea. It's 10 years since Troy has fallen. And here, uh, here he is, so close to home, and yet still so far. All the gods are looking down on Odysseus and feel pity for him, except for Poseidon. And we'll learn more about why Poseidon uh, has a grudge uh, against, against Odysseus later. Um, so, uh, within that first dialogue, uh, it's worth noting that this book starts off with the gods. The gods are discussing and discussing particularly the fate of Odysseus. And everyone feels bad for them. Athena goes to Zeus and pleads, like, can't we do something for this guy? You like him, I like him, can't we help him out? Um, and Zeus you know, says a number of things, and they start plotting uh, his homecoming. But before we get to that, uh, Zeus makes a really interesting comment about how the mortals blame the gods for their miseries, which starts us off with a really great question. Who, oh sorry, who's to blame for the miseries of men? This is a huge question for us when we were going through the Iliad. If you remember, uh, Priam, looking over the, the two armies, says to Helen, uh, it's not your fault that this war is happening, it's the gods' fault. Excuse me. And we went back and forth talking about who's more to blame, the gods or the mortals, uh, for this whole war. But right off the bat, uh, we see Zeus bringing that question up himself. They blame us for all these things, but it's not our fault. The mortals are just stupid. And he uses, uh, he points to a couple examples, particularly that of Orestes, the son of Agamemnon. And we'll get to his story a little bit when we get to book three, because it's recapped there as well. So I'm going to hold off on that for right now. Um, but anyways, uh, so those are the first, first two. And then Athena, after they plot, uh, Zeus and Athena are plotting Odysseus' homecoming, um, Athena goes down to Ithaca and enters under the, under the guise of Mentes. Um, and there we find a scene where in the house of Odysseus, there are dozens, if not hundreds of suitors, men who have come to marry Odysseus's wife, Penelope. Um, they're all waiting for her to pick one of them to marry because, again, it's been 10 years since Troy fell, but 20 years since Odysseus left. This island of Ithaca, this city-state, has been without a sovereign for 20 years. And so they want Penelope to pick someone, because not only is she like really cute and they want to marry her, but also they would then be the de facto king of Ithaca. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, interest in Penelope, um, not only because she is arguably the most B.A. woman in literature ever. She is my favorite uh, in everything I've read since, uh, there's no woman in literature who can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Penelope. She is my favorite. I'm a little bit biased. Anyways, um, 
Athena comes down, disguised as Mentes, uh, and there is Odysseus' son, Telemachus. Now, Telemachus is a little bit more than 20 years old. He was a baby when he left for war, and now he's, he's about 20 years old. Um, and he's sitting among the suitors and not having a great day because he's surrounded by all these men, but none of these men are his father. And none of these men have his best interest at heart either. They're just there to get with his mom. Um, so Athena is talking with him, and he says that he's heard rumors that Odysseus has died at sea, and Athena sparks some hope in him and says, no, 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 Odysseus is not dead, but he is lost at sea. He'll be home soon. This first, uh, dare I call it grace, from the gods, this first mercy uh, from the gods, from their omniscience, uh, being shared with, with Telemachus. And I am going to call him Telemachus, not Telemachus, or whatever other pronunciations uh, you might have thought uh, Tele uh, Telemachus is his name. Um, anyways, uh, and then while they're discussing, after Athena assures him, no, no, your father is alive, he has this interesting line where he says, who on his own has ever really known who gave him life? It's from those lines over there. Um, another translation renders it as, no one really knows his own father. Now, this is, an inc this is going to be an incredibly huge theme in this epic poem. The theme of identity. Of who are you? You, in this culture, you were defined largely by who your father was. And so if your identity is rooted in your father, but you've never met your father, you don't know who you are. Who on his own has ever really known who gave him life? This is, comes from a man who has gone 20 years without knowing his father. He's a child in a lot of ways because he's never been able to grow into a man because he doesn't know what a man is. And that's why Athena says to him at one point of, it's time for you to put away your boyish ways and to be a man. Um, but this is incredibly uh, important. Telemachus is about to go on his own little adventure, his own telemachy, as uh, scholars like to call it, um, to discover who he is. He's trying to find out who he is by finding out who his father is or was. Uh, which brings us to book two. Telemachus calls the assembly. All the suitors come. He calls them together to say, get out. Um, and they are like, mm, I don't know about that. Um, and he announces that he is going to begin his Telemachy. He's going to go on the, on the advice of Athena to visit Nestor and Menelaus um, and find some information about his father. Because again, he's, he's trying to find out who he is. Um, a sign is sent from Zeus, member of the eagles, and uh, at first, one of the characters interprets it like, oh, shoot, Odysseus is coming back, and we're all going to die. Spoiler alert, he's right. <laughs> but then another uh, character, Ant uh, Antinous, remember his name of the suitors, remember Antinous, because he's going to come up a lot. He immediately says, no, 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 those are just birds. Don't get all crazy religious or whatever and think they're from Zeus saying something about Odysseus returning and killing us. No, it's just birds. Whatever. We've seen this before, not just in the Iliad, but also throughout the Oedipus cycle, when more when we humans don't take seriously signs from the gods. Bad things happen. Um, when we have a lack of piety. Uh, if you remember Jocasta. Um, she said, like, no, 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 the gods don't rule anything. Fate is our own ruler. That is essentially intinuous, and we'll see how he ends up uh, by the end. Uh, it's also in book two that we learn about uh, Penelope in the loom. Uh, if you recall, she made this promise that, uh, let me make a burial shroud for my father-in-law, um, Laertes. Um, let me make finish making this burial shroud so that when I remarry, uh, I won't have, like, you know, just abandon my, my father-in-law. Um, and so they're like, all right, that sounds reasonable. Uh, finish making your uh, burial shroud. Um, and so she would work on it every day at the loom, but then at night she would undo all the progress so that she would never finish the shroud. Um, so she's, uh, she's super clever. Um, not unlike her husband, who is also called the strategist, the tactician, etc. 
Um, she's very crafty. And we're going to see that more in her um, as time goes on. Um, in this particular translation, in the Fagel's translation, she is called wary and reserved. That's one thing I don't like about the Fagel's translation is that they don't use this word, circumspect. Other translations like the Laudamore say that uh, as kind of that epigram, call Penelope circumspect. And if we just look at the word, uh, circum or circum mean around, and spect, what you see. She sees everything that's going on. She's no fool. But she's always very quiet, very cunning, very crafty. She sees everything that's going on. And we'll see more of kind of what she sees. That's going to be uh, uh, really important as well. Um, but yeah, so Penelope, super cool character. I love her. Um, let's move on to book three. Um, book three, uh, Salamachus goes and visits Nestor. We, we might remember Nestor from the Iliad. Uh, he was kind of the older uh, warrior king. Uh, really nice guy. Everyone loves Nestor. No one has anything bad to say about Nestor. So he's the first one they, they meet. Uh, Telemachus meets his son. He's immediately welcomed in like, a, like family. Um, and Nestor uh, and, and them kind of recount what he remembers of Odysseus. Put yourself in the shoes of Telemachus. This is the first time you're hearing a story about your father from someone other than your mom. Someone who's not just a man, but someone who fought alongside your father. This is huge. For us, it's easy to be like, like oh, he's getting a story about his, about his dad. But remember, he has nothing to go on. He's never heard anything about how his father acts in war, uh, what he looks like, how he walks, all these things. He's gotten some from his mom, but this is the first time it's kind of becoming real. For all he knows, his father could be a myth that his mother told him. But now he knows, okay, my father is real. This is the kind of man he was. Um, and then uh, Nestor also relates the story of the death of Agamemnon. Um, when Agamemnon returns uh, from, from Troy, um, he brings with him uh, a war prize, uh, Cassandra. Um, and when he returns, uh, Clytemestra has plotted his death, um, and she and her new lover uh, end up killing Agamemnon. Um, which probably shouldn't be too surprising. If you remember at the end of the movie Iphigenia, uh, it kind of zoomed in on Clytemestra's face, and that is a stricken mother, a mother who just watched her husband kill their own daughter. For what? For war? For more death? She is not happy. And the 10 years that Agamemnon is away, she is waiting for him to return so that she can kill him. But it doesn't end there. Um, after Clytemnestra uh, kills Agamemnon, um, Orestes, then comes uh, in, in, the, in the next saga uh, and murders uh, Clytemestra. Uh, when Nestor tells the story, Orestes is told uh, or is related in a positive light that what he did to avenge his father was a good thing. And that's very interesting because we did kind of get that story a little bit back here in book one. When Zeus relates the story, he just looks at them, at this extremely dysfunctional family, and just says, they're all miserable. They all kind of suck. Orestes, Clytemestra, Agamemnon, they're all miserable, but they have no one to blame for th but themselves. We had nothing to do with this. When the story is told in Book 3 by Nestor, he is praising Orestes for avenging his father. It's interesting whether Orestes is really honorable or not. Um, by the way, for the honor students, when we read uh, the, the Orestia, it'll be his, uh, that story. Um, and so we'll get a closer look at um, that whole saga. Anyways, um, so that's the most salient points for these first three books. Um, we've opened up with a brief look at Odysseus, a um, quick glimpse into the gods, and then we're coming down, and for right now, for the next few books, for the first five books, I believe, we're going to be following Telemachus um, as he discovers who he is by trying to discover who his father is. But it's not going to be until much later in this book when they're finally going to meet face to face. Remember when we say we made echoes of the
the greenhouse walls, the heart.